my very first 45 record I bought was 123 Red Light in 1968. I was nine, and I grew sick of it after only a couple of days. Top 40. But on the B-side was a song called Sticky Sticky. It was like the weird Beatles stuff. I loved the Beatles when they got weird. Unusual instruments and rhythms, taped effects, complex progression. That always caught my ear before those simple pop songs. By 13, I was into psychedelic music way before I even discovered psychedelics. <laughs> and I detested Top 40 Radio. Through high school growing up in Vermont, I listened to an FM station out of Montreal featuring prog rock, early electronic music, and Quebecois art rock. <laughs> Brian Eno quickly became and still is a god. I got involved with my college radio station, snagged the primo 8 to 11 Sunday night spot my first summer, and kept it until I graduated. You're listening to the Candlelight Breeze on 90.1 WRUV FM in Burlington. <laughs> I served up a steady diet of the trippiest and most obscure music I could find in the vast and already mildewing record library. My roommates, they were deadheads, so I grew to love those long space jams and Jerry Garcia's noodling. For money, I worked at the Old Board Restaurant and Nightclub, the biggest disco in Burlington. <laughs> disco, the scourge of the 70s. <laughs> R&B and funk gone horribly awry. Today, it's a novelty. Back then, many knew it for what it was, the beginning of the end of civilization. <laughs> When I graduated as an electrical engineer, I punted on my fantasy of designing music synthesizers and first-generation digital audio. I needed a job, and the jobs were in computers and defense. I landed a job in Indianapolis. I got married, and my first son was born in 1982. <laughs> MTV was new and fun to watch, but the music was still mostly cheesy top 40 radio. I located the hip part of town with the cool live venues and indie record store where I could mine for good music. I sucked up as much used vinyl as I could afford. My son's first toys were mostly musical, a Schroeder piano, xylophone, harmonica. I would put on music and we would jam along together. By now I was into jazz, the real stuff, not that Kenny G <laughs> white bread shit. <laughs> also blues and reggae. The music of my college friends I had left behind and now missed. In 83, I took a new job, and that moved us to San Diego. And a few months later, I hit a couple of Grateful Dead shows at Irvine Meadows, and I was hooked. Through the 80s, five or six times a year, a weekend of Dead shows was within a day's drive. This became a cherished and brief and chemically enhanced escape <laughs> from my suburban life and defense contractor job. My second son was born in 1985, and by the end of the 80s, it was clear neither kid was the soccer and t-ball type. <laughs> but as state-of-the-art suburban parents, you are required to find a weekend activity for your kids. My older son, Adam, loved music and was high energy. Neil was mellower, more of a Legos and Nintendo guy. We put them in a group piano class. Adam flamed out after about a month, no patience for it. Neil realized it was something that he could do better than his brother, so he still plays today, 20 years later. <laughs> we enrolled Adam in voice lessons in a children's theater group, musicals. I always hated musicals. <laughs> but it was a great group of kids, and we became good friends with some of the other parents. And thankfully, they never did Oklahoma. <laughs> when I was a kid, watching the annual airing of Oklahoma on television was my mother's perverse form of child abuse. <laughs> Adam's love for voice grew, but began veering off in the wrong direction. <laughs> no matter how many cool vocalists I turned him on to, Bowie, Morrissey, Robert Plant, even Otis Redding, he would listen to En Vogue, <laughs> Backstreet Boys, Destiny's Child. He was becoming our musical Alex P. Keaton. At 13, he begged me to take him to his first concert. When I was 13, I begged my brother to take me to see Led Zeppelin at the Forum. Adam wanted to go see Paula Abdul at the sports <laughs> arena. Yeah, go ask your mother. 
In the late 90s, he got into retro 70s disco. One day I came home to Brick House playing at full volume. I turned into my father. I stomped up the stairs and turned off the stereo and yelled. I said, it's inhumane that I'm being forced to live through this fucking music twice in one lifetime. <laughs> but dad, dad, it's cool, he said. No, no, it's never been cool. Never. People only liked it back then because the quaaludes were real, the cocaine was snorted, and everybody was having sex with anybody because nobody was worried that it had to be safe yet. <laughs> he rolled his eyes and put on the headphones. I had become the uncool dad. <laughs> After graduation, Adam enrolled in Fullerton's theater program. It only lasted a month when he realized that everything they were teaching him, he knew already. And worse, he was required to take remedial math. Math to him is like opera to me. It's complex and important work, but it's essentially a form of waterboarding. <laughs> he got a job as a lead singer on a cruise ship, or like we, as we used to call it, the lounge singer Navy. <laughs> a year later, he found something more hip, a six-month tour of the musical Hair in Germany. He and the rest of the cast fully embracing the sex, drugs, and rock and roll theme of the show on and off stage. Back in L.A. in 05, he landed short-term theater gigs and had a part-time retail job. One store offered him a full-time management position. He called and asked if, he thought, if I thought he should take it. Remembering how I jettisoned my passion in exchange for a good job all those years ago, I couldn't help but tell him no. Keep chasing the dream, Ad. You're only 23. This turned out to be the right answer since he had already turned down the job. Occasionally, he'd call me for supplemental cash for bare necessities like food, rent, <laughs> or camping supplies for the annual Burning Man trip, <laughs> which I came to understand was essentially a run of dead shows in the desert, but without the dead. <laughs> Eventually, desperate for income, he hit his low point in a Lake Tahoe musical version of Debbie Does Dallas. No one in the family was allowed to come see his throwaway <laughs> male lead in a cluster of tits and thongs. Finally, he secured a long-running solid gig back in L.A. in the chorus of a show, Wicked, and started a band with some friends on the side. August of 2008, he called and said he was going to try out for American Idol. Not a big TV watcher. I heard of it, but knew nothing about it. He said thousands were trying out. I said, oh, okay, I wished him luck. <laughs> in October, he called to say that he was in the final top 40 and he was going to be on the show but had to quit his job at Wicked. Wait, 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 wait. You're going to quit your best paying job ever with benefits to go on a game show? <laughs> dad, dad, it's the number one show on television. Is it? <laughs> How much are they gonna pay? Oh, I don't get paid until next summer and only if I make the top 10. How the fuck <laughs> are you going to live nine months without income? The call went rapidly downhill from there. <laughs> In February, after I discovered what a hideous spectacle the first month of that show actually is, he made the top 12. And we all celebrated. Two weeks later, I missed my favorite performance of his live, a slithering Middle Eastern version of Johnny Cash's Ring of Fire <laughs> that freaked middle America out. <laughs> After that, I committed to go up to every Tuesday for the live show. We would talk on the phone every Friday and about what songs he was thinking about doing the next week. Of course, all of my suggestions were summarily discarded. The closest I got was to get him to shortlist Instant Karma for 70s Week. He sang, play that funky music, white boy. <laughs> Stinging irony is a cornerstone of any good father-son relationship. <laughs> a 
Over the next four months, I met an odd assortment of celebrities in the live audience. Paul Abdul. <laughs> Glenn Campbell slash Smokey Robinson. But unlikeliest of all, that excitable pop music fanboy, Sir Anthony Hopkins. <laughs> Hannibal fucking Lecter slapping me on the back <laughs> and giving Adam a standing O for singing A Change Is Gonna Come. <laughs> no amount of recreational drug use can, can prepare a person for something like this. <laughs> Adam ended up coming in second, made the tour in his payday, and released his first album in 2010, scored a top hit on Top 40 Radio. He toured the US, Europe, Southeast Asia, and last July he sang with the remaining members of Queen for seven shows in Europe. I never really liked Queen. <laughs> but I kept that to myself and my son Neil and I flew over to London to see the shows and they were great. Since I switched to collecting CDs way back in the late 80s, last September I unwrapped the first brand new vinyl record I've opened in 28 years. Adam's second album. And even with all that has happened, it was an amazing moment for me. He had caught the dream. It hit number one on Billboard for a week, so I tuned into the local Top 40 radio station <laughs> during my morning and evening commute, hoping to hear them play his new single. This only lasted a couple of days, however, because that top 40 radio shit, it's still unlistenable. <laughs> Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Eber Lambert. <laughs> 